controlled area. And when we tried to follow her, we discovered that actually we didn't have any signal there anyway. So as you can imagine, with the highs and lows of the terrain, it does make a difference in terms of broadcasting a live safari from the middle of the African bush. So far, so good. We seem to be okay. I'm sort of inching closer and closer to where Wendy might not be able to go. Dave, do you know the way here? Yes, sir. Oh, good. That is marvelous news. What are you fighting about, you lot? What's up? Ah. They were having a little go at each other, but they seem to have calmed down. A group starting off the morning with a group of crested Franklin. No, it's not morning, it's afternoon. I may or may not have had a little nap that makes it feel a bit like morning. Hello. Out of the spur fowl family, you can see the spur, that, that looks like a male to me. Just in the back of his legs there is a spur protruding and is his it's, it's a residual toe and it's hardened and more calloused and slightly larger in the males and they use that for fighting each other in a way that is relatively entertaining as you can imagine because it is of course on the back of their foot rather than the front it means they have to try and sort of reverse kick in a Chuck Norris style dance in order to use utilize them Oh, there's one right right next to the vehicle. Or oh. what you got? Ran away with whatever it was. It actually looks like it's eating some sort of cricket or something similar. And having to scrape its bill clean on the grass. Okay. But our leopard cubs await us and I simply cannot wait any longer. So I'm going to carry on and go and find them because I'm too excited. Sorry, Franklin. Enjoy your afternoon. Now, don't forget, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, that you can send through questions on... Oh, how lovely. Hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. Or you can email through on questions at wildearth.tv. Why, for example, perhaps these zebra would find themselves on the top of a termite mound might be an example of a question you might ask. The answer, of course, is because termite mounds tend to have a slightly higher nutritional level to their soils, and therefore the plants that grow on them tend to maintain their nutritional content a little bit longer. This looks like where we're going to go anyway. I see Brent's off-road tracks leading me down towards the Mulwati. So, Do we dare to go into the Mulati without our Gauri signal? How brave are we feeling? Pretty brave. I feel pretty brave. I feel confident we will be absolutely fine. All right. Let's try to go into the Mulati drainage line itself. Wow, it's hot today. Supposedly it's 27 and 80, but I have to tell you in the sun I think it's warmer. So 27 centigrade, 80 Fahrenheit in case that needed clarifying, although I don't see how you could possibly mix them up. Oh, very warm. And that sun is starting to get its summer strength back. It's back to sunblock for us each and every day. That gentle layer, or that sort of layer of sunblock that builds up on your skin throughout a summer day, collecting dust along the way. <laughs> Hello, Zebbies. I'm not coming off road to look at you, I promise, even though you are lovely. Don't get me wrong. Had some interesting zebra behavior yesterday. There is also, for those of you who are sharp-eyed, really sharp-eyed, there is also a water buck, but it is hidden at the present behind the zebra on the left. I can't see it anymore. But there was a water buck bull as well. Oh, we're about to get to my absolute favorite part 
of Juma, one of my favourite spots in Juma. Well done, Dave. There's the water buck. He's beautiful. Let's go, guys, because we won't have forever to spend with those cubs before we have to make room for other vehicles. So we've got to make hay while the sun shines, or at least take advantage of the sighting before anybody else is out on their afternoon safari. We can always come back and look at these zebra later. While I attempt to find my way in, because word is, word on the street is that it's difficult to get in here, let's go over to Brent and find out how his search for the Oompa Loompa, I mean the Inkuhumas, is going. Well, see, unfortunately for me, I don't have to search for an Oompa Loompa. I've got one on camera. That's, uh, I am continuing my search for the Inkuhuma pride. But while we're there, I just noticed this beautiful big kudu bull. Hello, mister. There's lions about. You better watch yourself. There we go. There's an even bigger bull coming through from the back. I'll wait for him to clear the bush. And some impalalas. Very, very still. It's about 27 degrees Celsius and 72 Fahrenheit. And at this time of the day, a lot of your sort of noisy insects and, and birds are completely silent. And here comes that big, big kudu bull now. He's bigger than the first one. Massive spread on his horns. And there he is. Beautiful. Mating leopards. I'm pretty sure I just heard mating leopards just down the drag. Well, sorry about that. From Sedate Kudu, we need to get into that area. So they mate quite quickly, especially if it's new mating. Um, I would have guessed not far. Probably just north of Juma Dam. This could be very interesting because Karula is not far from here as well. What's she going to do? Sorry, Impalalas, coming through. I'm looking at four cats who are in the, in, the, in the moment, let's say that. Now, I know Jamie said she thought she heard was possibly mating lions or leopards this morning. Um, but her car was on. We were fortunate that our car was off at that very moment. I'm going to say that in here. This is quite interesting because it's the same area where we think the rest of the Inkahuma Pride is. Okay, so hold on. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get up into where I thought I heard them, which is the top of this little uh, gully over here, a little drainage gully. And then I'm going to switch off and listen again. But, or we might just be lucky enough and spot them. And that is the one positive about the dry season and a drought. Spotting animals is a little bit easier when there's not lots of grass about. I wonder who it could be, because I know Tingana went on to Hoffman's. And could all, uh, the old boy, Mvula, be at it again? Or could it be the ghost from the north, Kojima? So we were there, so I'm saying, I think they were right about here. Anywhere from this termite mound in front of us, heading north up this little river system. Now what quite often happens if the lions are around and they hear those leopards mating, they quite often go chase them. But we could be in for a treat. They're still in parlor there and they're sounding, and they're looking completely relaxed. Okay, I'm gonna sit on my door, get a bit of a 
better look around here. That's so, such a distinct sound. is after mating. Sometimes they do move um, and then lie down and sleep. So that's, I'm going to head up right to the head of this little river system. She keep checking under all the bushes here. So this is the one of the few times, oopsie, we don't track following tracks. We track by our ears. When lions are roaring is another time or leopards calling. Come on, kitties. Okay, what I'm going to do now, I'm going to find a spot for Jandra and I to sit quietly and listen. So it's normally about 15 minutes, sometimes as short as 10 minutes if they've just started mating between bouts of mating. And and hopefully we will hear them. I think it's probably been about six minutes since the last one. Now I think we almost bang on the money to where we heard it from maybe a little bit further to the east. So actually, I think I'm gonna pop myself in the shade here and listen quietly. So fingers crossed. This is really exciting. I mean, who could it be? So you can see how close we are to Juma itself. There's the FC antenna. Well, my Instagram picture of the day was of the wrong mating pair. So we're gonna sit here really quietly and listen, looking for mating leopards now three leopards there, there's two leopards here, we might be able to equal the Safari Live record of five leopards in a drive. Fingers crossed. So let's speak. Oh, there you go. Isn't this exciting news? I knew, I knew this morning, didn't I say, Dave, there's something mating next to Sydney's dam. So this is really, really exciting. But in the meantime, since Brent has lost signal, we have something to keep you equally happy. My first time seeing the little cubs in what feels like forever, but is probably only about a month or so. No, yeah, about a month or so. And my goodness, I know this sounds very silly because of course they've grown. That's what babies do. Oh. But they really have grown. Hey, Hosanna, look how big you're getting. <laughs> Did you catch mom? Oh, look at this. Can you believe we are watching leopard cubs live from the middle of the African bush? Does this not astound you every day? Look at the love coming from Karula. Gently cleaning off her little boy, making sure he hasn't missed any spots. While he's been feeding on the impala kill that she caught for them. Hey, Mom, not my ear. Not in my ear. Look at me, I'm a fierce predator. Don't need to be cleaned. Oh, he's gorgeous. Might be my imagination, but he's starting to, to me, looks quite stately almost. He's definitely got a dignity to him that I didn't really, I haven't noticed before. He really truly does. There's something, I don't know what it is. 
an air of stateliness about him, as if he knows how famous he is, and he accepts it as his due. Going over to his sister, flopping down, so Shungile, the beautiful one, is sleeping off to the right there, and Karula's got something up her nose, probably Khosana's fur. The portrait of a Friday afternoon family life, or the leopards of Juma. And if Brent, when Brent, finds those mating leopards, because I have absolute faith in his ability to do so, when Brent finds those mating leopards, we will have five different leopards on screen. <laughs> mating, and then the product of many, many months ago when Karula mated with the cub's father. Oh, they're so gorgeous. So absolutely gorgeous. Look at his expression, what you're watching. What you're seeing. Oh, one thing that we do do each and every time we see these magnificent cats is we put them into a database called Panthera. Now this is something that we haven't touched on yet but it is today is in fact International Tigers Day and we at the Wild Earth family along with all or sort of everybody else around the world are celebrating both the tigers and what International Tigers Day actually represents which is of course the protection of all kinds of endangered species. Now, there might be more leopards than tigers but they're still incredibly valuable and the research that Panthera does and that we help them to do, up she goes into the tree. She's going to go and munch on some more of that impala. such grace and dignity. Oh yes, the research that Panthera does, incredibly valuable in terms of determining the number of different leopards in an area, their paternity, getting to know a little bit more about these amazing cats. Let's go back a little bit and we will have a look at her from a different angle. Since the cubs are largely flat and hidden away on the bank, let's reposition ourselves ever so slightly and we can keep talking about International Tigers Day. So, truly valuable species in terms of the conservation, one that I absolutely dream of seeing one day. It would be incredible to witness. Let's just concentrate on getting you a good view. going to be a bit tricky. Cool, perfect. Thank you, Dave. She's eating away at whatever's left of the carcass. I have to tell you, I think it's going to fall out in the next, I think by the end of this, uh, tonight, it's going to have fallen out of the tree. Now, just quickly, the valuable, valuable research that Panthera does, they also do with tigers throughout Asia and Eastern, Eastern Asia in terms of keeping track of them, learning a bit more about their DNA and their, be their paternities and their behaviours, mapping their genome, which in turn brings us really truly valuable research in, term in conservation terms. Something that's exceptionally important to remember that for all endangered creatures, having a research organisation like that is incredibly valuable in terms of protecting them and looking after them. So we would like you all to join us on this International Tigers Day, not just in terms of celebrating tigers and the amazing animals that they are, but also all of our endangered big cats and our endangered animals in general. And of course, oh, hold on, one of them cubs is coming. Oh, she laid on. <laughs> exactly where Dave won't be able to see her. I thought she was going to come and join Mom up the tree. Or he, actually. The cubs' eye colours have changed a little bit since I last saw them. Shungile's are not as brown, and her brothers are slightly browner. Well, that's what it feels like to me, anyway. And you can hear the gentle crunching of bone as Karula chews around the rib cage of this female impala. A seriously impressive feat that she managed to accomplish there dragging it up into the tree 
Apparently, according to Brent, she had it up in that tree when there was still lots and lots of meat left in it. At which point, that impala probably weighed about Karula size. She truly is a powerful cat. Because imagine trying to lift your own body weight up a tree, using only your teeth and your fingernails. I know it's something I harp on about, but just imagine it. Because it really does go show what incredible creatures leopards truly are. Welcome to Monty on our sunset safari as we wait for these leopards to find themselves a more observable position. I've mentioned that the cubs are growing up. They feel as though they certainly no longer have that soft, fuzzy look to them. And they're starting to look like little sleek miniatures of their mother. Monty wants to know when they will go on their first hunt. Monty, they've probably been on their first hunt already. The leopards are not like cheetah or lion, where they take their cubs with them whenever they go hunting. In fact, almost always they actually leave them behind until they are almost at the age of independence. However, what leopards do and the way that leopard cubs learn is they hunt themselves. They practice and they hunt themselves. So they probably already practiced stalking things like Franklin or dwarf mongoose, whatever movement has attracted their attention or each other's tails. Even that valuable playing is learning and practicing the skills that they will need at a later stage. Crunch goes the Imbala. Now Monty, it will be only really when the cubs are quite a lot older that mom... It's, it's not unheard of for a female leopard to bring back prey that's still alive and to lead her cubs to it, or to, to bring it to her cubs and let them try and kill it. So it does happen. They're not really cooperative hunters though, so a female leopard doesn't really want her little cubs scampering about her when she learns, when she's hunting. And this, the state of survival is too tenuous for them to be able to do that. So it's not that she takes them on their first hunt, it's that they learn to hunt themselves. And the moment that we first see them with a their first kill, I think we'll all feel a sense of pride as if we've somehow contributed in any way to that, which of course we haven't. But there will be a sense of pride when they first catch, or at least we first see them catching their first prey. I look forward to it tremendously. Now generally, the little girl, the female, will start to hunt and to practice those sorts of skill more and more regularly than her brother, her hunting efforts will also take her farther afield. Because female leopard cubs tend to show much more independence than their male counterparts at an earlier age. As to why that might be, we don't really 100% know. It does, it does sort of make sense. It flies everywhere, thanks to the carcass. Um, it makes sense because the males, of course, need a little bit of extra time spent with mom and extra time gathering their strength because life for a young male is more dangerous than it is for a young female. And the young females get a portion of their mother's territory, usually. Not always. It's not always as simple as that, but they usually do. So they can afford to be independent a little bit younger. And there's also the fact, I suppose, something that occurs to me is that they're gearing up for being able to, or having to, support youngsters of their hunting skills, not just themselves. Now, they have to perfect those skills as quickly as possible because by two, they will be sexually mature and ready to have their first litter of cubs. And it's very, very important that they can support, they have the skills to support not only themselves, but their little ones as well. Something, of course, that Karula is tremendously good at. In a world where raising leopard cubs is exceptionally difficult and the f rate of failure is unbelievably high, Karula is a cat that beats the odds somehow. Her ability to hoist an adult female impala is probably one of the big reasons why she is so successful. I also think she's got wisdom in where she places the cubs, where she leaves them. There's no denying that Karula's been incredibly successful, statistically more successful than any leopard I've ever heard of. Hey girl, you're doing well. A 
and welcome to Kelly. It is wonderful to have you on board and I hope you are enjoying this wildlife spectacle that we have to offer you. Now Kelly wants to know if the cubs will climb up into the tree like mom to eat or if she will bring food down for them. Uh, Kelly, she, they'll climb up. They've been climbing since they were a couple of weeks old, albeit not always entirely successfully, but at this point now at nearly six months old, and they're very, very close to being six months old, they have perfected the art, almost, sort of, of tree climbing, and they're more than happy to go up into trees. And even from about four months of age, when they were totally weaned, we were watching them climb into trees to feed off the carcass. And the little ones would sort of clamber on top of it and spread eagle themselves to stay balanced over it and then munch away at it. Crunching away. Oh, whoopsie! Oh, she was going to fall out of the tree there. I actually got a fright. <laughs> but it was just the carcass slipping. This is awesome. Now what I'm really hoping is that most people would have had their fill of this sighting this morning and that we can sit here for the rest of the afternoon, spend some time with the cubs playing around as it starts to get a bit cooler and therefore their energy levels start to get higher. Ah, oh, but Karula's presenting us with a fantastic view. The true stereotype of a leopard up in the tree with a dangling impala. I read a story recently about a leopard in this Kukuza rest camp in the Kruger National Park that strung the impala kill right up above, in the tree, above where the restaurant is. Something that I absolutely cannot imagine but must be incredible. And whenever I think of leopards with their kills in trees, there's so many different images that pop back into my head of beautiful sightings that I've had to enjoy. Hello, girl. Now guys, I'm sure you're wondering about how Brent's leopard search is going, and I'm sure he would like to give you a quick update on that. He hasn't found them yet, but perhaps he can give you a little bit more information about how that search is going. We've sat very quietly, and, and we haven't heard anything again. And I'm now just doing a little zigzag through here. And uh, zigzag is the word due to the elephant activity around here. And every time you think you found a path, uh, there's a fallen tree in the way. And we lovely open blocks. Once uh, we get some rain, grass will be very happy to have all that tree cover above them. I'm still convinced that they're around here somewhere. So. What often happens during the heat of the day, the, the mating will slow down a bit. So when it's cool, they are very vigorous. And during the heat of the day, which it is now, uh, that mating slows down. So it could be as long as 20 minutes or half an hour in between mating sessions. So while we keep checking for these uh, mating leopards, Jamie's got a leopard up a tree. From the search for mating leopards to a leopard munching away on her impala lunch, I think that this will be potentially uh, the last that we get to see of her, at least in this place, since the kill is nearly, nearly finished. 
Sorry, I'm just listening to the Game Drive updates from Ephraim, and apparently there is another dead elephant on Buffles Hook. So, <laughs> the Lions are going to be having an absolute field day. It is starting, I think it is starting to be the result of the drought. Some of the older elephants, that's, that's normal though, for the dry season, is as the, the level of nutrition gets lower and lower in the, the plant material that they're eating, they do start, the older elephants start to die around the dry season. If the food is just too hard for them to eat with their worn down teeth. Unfortunately, another elephant has died in Buffles Hook, but it will be providing food for the rest of the animals in this area for weeks and weeks to come. <laughs> Audrey, you wanted to know whether I've ever seen a leopard fall out of the tree because we were discussing the cub's tree climbing skills and of course we've seen them fall out of the tree and other leopard cubs countless times. But Audrey wanted to know, Audrey by the way is 12 years old, if I've ever seen one fall out of the tree and get hurt. The answer is no, I have never seen a leopard fall out of the tree and injure itself. They are very, very good at covering up for a fall and landing on their feet, just like domestic house cats. However, Audrey, I have seen a leopard fall We're sitting quietly and listening again, hoping to hear that very distinct <laughs> What? I'm sure I can turn that off. Oh, ah, I have two. So you can see it's very clear there. Blue, blue skies, and we have some gorgeous light a little later, and I'm really hoping to put some leopards in it. Come on, make another noise. Now, we're sitting on the crest uh, of a little hillock here, and Tree species that dominate these areas are marullas, uh, terminalias, and bush willows. The odd acacia, not too many, and also you get these monkey orange thickets. And the elephants have done a nice job of clearing out some of these monkey orange thickets. Um, sorry, I just got to chat to Orby quickly. He's helping us look for these leopards. Orbs, I was on in Vubu when I heard the, the audio. I'm now standing by in the center of that, that block between the fire break and gari cut line, just trying to wait for them to mate again. Now it's incredible. Uh, oh, it sounds like Jamie's back and she's still with those wonderful leopards. So while we try to find these other leopards, let's go see. That was very strange, a random and very uh, unexpected attack of the gremlins. So we're sorry, we're sorry we disappeared off your screen. Oh, what have you got there, Karula? Mouthful of something that she, uh, ah, she spat it out. I think it was a clump of skin and hair. We were busy talking about Audrey's question, about whether or not I've seen leopards fall out of trees, and I was saying that, yes, I have. And whilst they don't tend to injure themselves, they definitely look thoroughly embarrassed by their faux pas. And we saw it with Tingana once, where he tried to pull a warthog up into a tree, but completely underestimated 
I think the sort of verticalness of the tree itself and also the weight of the warthog, and he sort of fell out. It wasn't my sighting, I think it was with James, but it, it was absolutely, I watched it later, it was hilarious, the expression on his face, that sheepish look, and they, they sort of try and put it off like they meant to do that all along, but you know different, and they know you know different. I, honestly, I, I'm sure that's quite anthropomorphic. Oh, this carcass is about to come out. This is very, very close to coming out of the tree. It is now being held in the tree by one leg. At least I think that's the case. Yeah, it's just one leg that's holding it up there. The rest of it is dangling, and it is going to come tumbling down. Karula's not too worried about keeping it up there, though. Okay, so she stops feeding. I think it might be nice to go and see what those cubs are up to and see whether or not they are visible. I don't think they are. I think that they've gone flat down underneath this tree. It's a lovely tree. It's like a gardenia, actually. Bushveld gardenia. That they've, she's managed to put the kill in. And the cubs are sleeping somewhere underneath there. So we'll go forward and we'll just have a look. I just wanted to contact Ephraim very briefly on the Game Drive channel before I do. Hi, uh, Ephraim. You're welcome to make your way. Uh, both the um, Fuzzy and the Muffin Puns are on the bank here, on the eastern side. Just telling Ephraim where to go in, because he wants to come and join us, but he's got to do it from a different angle to us, otherwise he's not going to see anything. Very, very little left of this carcass, except for the meat on the legs and a bit of the neck and the head. I've seen Karula with smaller antelope. I've seen her eat an entire steenbok from start to finish in about, I would say, about 40 minutes. In my mind, it seemed faster, which is why I often said it felt like 20 minutes, but it was probably about 40 minutes. She ate the entire thing, bones and all. So it's not true that lions and leopards don't eat bones. They're not, maybe, they're not as good as it as hyena are, and they will tend to leave the larger bones alone, but they are more than capable with their jaw pressure of crunching through the smaller bones, the bones like the ribs, particularly the ends of the rib cage. They can and they will eat through that. With things like monkeys, they will consume the entire animal. And Kelly Brewer, it is lovely to have you on board. Kelly says that this is actually her first safari experience and that she's checking it out for her kindergarten students. Oh, I'm sorry to present you with a slightly gory view of our leopards, but that is simply the way of things out here. Kelly, it's wonderful to have you on board. Um, and just so you know, we do actually gear different drives towards, so usually a portion of our drive is very often geared towards kids, school kids of different ages. So it's something that I particularly really love doing. And we are on every day, twice a day, and you're more than welcome to jump on board with us with absolutely any time. And we can also answer the kids' questions for them so they get to hear their names as well on a live safari. Okay, let's reposition ever so slightly and see whether or not those cubs are there. I'm just looking at the vulture that is flying over. I wonder if Karula's going to be spotted. I think she's been spotted. I can't see it. It's just above Dave's head, unfortunately. Mm, maybe not. That's why leopards like to hide their kills in such dense trees, because it protects them from the eyes of scavenging birds that might then be responsible for putting the kill down onto the ground. Right, keep your eyes on the cubs here, obviously, because we've just seen them. Let's try and get a different view. I think Karula's going to come down relatively soon. soon. Where are you little bundles of fluff? Where on earth did you go? Uh, no. Can't see them. You got him? No. Me neither. Hmm. Did you go into the drainage line, maybe? They must be playing somewhere off, just out of view. I think I see a flickering shadow. 
No, that's Karula's shadow. Huh. Imagine that. Two little leopard cubs have vanished. Am I being dense? I don't think so. I think they must have moved further in. Okay, let's try. Rather than repositioning like this, let's go up onto the bank and see what our view is like. Our view is like up from there. Otherwise, we'll stick with our view of Karula. We're definitely not complaining. Watch your head there, Dave. Now, while I do this backwards, I'm not quite sure why I decided it was a good idea to do this backwards. Let's go back over to Brent and find out a little bit more about his search for the mating leopards. It's actually quite a good view. Well, the mating leopards are, are very much a sort of Russian weight type of track. And we've rushed. And now we're waiting. Just waiting for that sound to pierce through the still afternoon air. Now when I say still, I can hear one hornbill. The odd insect, but at this time of the day is when the bush is actually its most quiet. Come on, guys, mate again. So the problem is every time we move, if they mate while we're moving in the car, oops, our chances are fail a lot of finding them. So the reason you'll notice that. Occasionally, when you come to me, my radio is on. It's because I need my ears. So, Jean Ray kindly listens to Final Control for me, and I actually take my earpiece off. But also, Aubrey is looking for these leopards as well. So, I actually need to have the game drive comms on. But even if they're on down there, but not in my ears, it, my hearing is much, much better. Okay, so we're just going to have a... quick... Oh! No. I thought I heard something. I think it's a car, though. I mean, look at this. You can see the power of an elephant next to us, yeah? I just pushed down that marula tree, and I can tell you that's a big elephant. Probably a big bull because of where the the tree is broken. So if it had been a female, it would have fallen a bit lower to the ground. It's incredibly impressive to be able to break something like that. Okay, we're gonna move it on again a little bit in the bush in the block here. There you go, look at that. Oh, one lone Franklin. Hmm. Okay. So, let's move on. Now, I'm not moving very far. I just sort of go maybe 100, not even meters at a time before I stop, switch off and listen. I'm, I'm convinced that we heard them in this general area. Now, if it is Mr. Gajima mating the ghost from the north, it could be very interesting because we're probably going to have to stay quite far back. Uh, I know quite a few people have been asking if there's any noticeable sign of anything from that little bit of rain. Well, only one plant has really sprung to life after the rain. And we've got a whole little group of it here. The baboon's tail. See all that greenery, and uh, hopefully, we're going to be seeing those beautiful little light purple flowers uh, in the next couple of days. It's going to be the first to flower after the dry season if there's a little bit of rain. So, while we continue our listening game, let's go see those wonderful leopards uh, with Jamie. 
I'm also playing a little bit of a listening game, seeing if perhaps I can't hear the cubs rustling off in the bush to give me an idea as to where they might be. Obviously, we're sitting right below this enormous sandbank, so for now we're going to settle for this view of Queen Karula, because we've actually got a nice spot here. And what a peaceful way to spend a Friday afternoon, just sitting and watching her as she consumes what's left of her impala meal. And it just goes to show how voracious these little cubs' appetites are, because between three leopards, they've finished off an adult impala in pretty much 24 hours. It'll be just over 24 hours by the time they finish it, which is most impressive. I've been checking the trees, I've been looking all over for them. My only suggestion is that they've gone to lie down in the shade, a little bit away from where we are now, just outside of our view. Here we settle with the view of Queen Karula. It gives us a nice opportunity to spend some time with her because I think whenever she's with her cubs, I think we sort of, we get very distracted by their antics. And it's nice to just reacquaint ourselves and spend some time with her and watching her. And of course her two oldest daughters also have cubs. Shadow has got one five-month-old cub, or nearly five months old. We're not sure exactly how old Shadow's cub is. But she's close to five months now. And then Tundi has uh, two confirmed new cubs. I'm not sure whether anybody's given you that update, actually. It is confirmed that it's two. We haven't moved far. We're <laughs> sitting quietly again. But I think... What I'm going to do is I'm going to try to get out of the block now. I'm going to check on the fire break. Maybe check a little bit back towards the top of that little river system. Oh, ah. Oh, there we go. Little Cokie Franklins. Very cool little birds. That's a female. I'm sure we'll spot the male if we look carefully. That's a little female Koki Franklin. Let's move a little bit forward. Maybe we'll see the male. Now, their call is one of the more amusing. The best way to describe it is it sounds like a rusty bed spring. I thought I saw some movement around here that could be the male. Ah, there we go. Underneath that little arch there, Jean, right? That one there. Oh, with this berry. There's the male with the orange or burnt orange head. Oh, there we go. Off they go. Oh, it's a very strange little call, little contact call from the Frank. Talking to each other. Oh, no sound of those leopards yet. Actually, yeah, almost an ideal temperature. I mean, shorts, sandals, shirt, 27 degrees, wonderful. Of course, as that sun dips below the horizon, it's going to get quite chilly quite quickly. Come on, kitties.
Lynn High. And Lynn's in sunny, sunny Florida. And Lynn would like to know if there are any carnivorous plants in and around the Kruger. Uh, there's one or two, Lynn, but they're very, very rare. Uh, you generally find carnivorous plant species either to be in very harsh climates, uh, so either desert or rain, rainforest. Uh, I'm trying to think. The stapedia or carrion flower. But that, that sort of smells more like carrion to get pollinated rather than actually carnivorous. Although some flies and that do get stuck in that smelly sap and does give them some nutrients, but it's not the main reason. Um, John Ray, can you think of any carnivorous plants in Kruger? It's normally deserts and, and rainforests tend to have those. Come on, kitty cats. Look, that, no, it attracts flies for pollination, not for eating. All right, so it seems like Wendy's found a gremlin nest. Uh, hopefully, she'll be up and running shortly. Uh, we do apologize for all the bashing and crashing and the noises that you might be picking up as we move off-road through the bush. Uh, hopefully, it's going to be worth it. There are mating leopards if you're late to the Safari Live party uh, on this Friday evening somewhere around here so we're trying our best to find them unfortunately that does sometimes take us a wee away from the beaten track well, of course if i see anything else interesting while i'm looking for these leopards i will stop such as those little cokey franklin we just saw I'm trying to avoid an old leadwood stump. Okay. We're getting to one of my least favorite types of area on Juma, and that is the monkey orange thicket. I'm going to try to avoid as much of it as possible. It is incredibly noisy to drive through. on this open patch here. Yeah. Now, of course, Jamie's been telling you it's International Tiger Day. And uh, Panthera is a worldwide organization uh, for the conservation of big cats. And, of course, we collect all those scat samples uh, around the Sabi Sands of the, the leopards uh, for genetic tests. We've got a couple of multiple projects going on. Uh, one is paternity. The more important thing is when they manage to confiscate or, or find illegally obtained leopard skins. There we go. And the genetics of those skins, we can determine where those leopards came from. There we go. So it's, it's really important and as nice as, that, as it is for us to know that the paternity of our leopards and a lot of, uh, there's always a lot of speculation about who's the daddy of our leopards and 
as uh, a lot of people look at spot patterns and similar markings on the coat saying oh it's the same as Tingana and stuff and uh, that probably one of the worst ways to try uh, get paternity because uh, the spot patterns and the, the spot variations probably has about as much to do with telling who is the leopard's father or mother for that matter as uh, well, let's try as let's think of a nice analogy so probably about as about you got about as much chance as uh Oh, sorry, I'm back in a second. I just thought I saw a track here. So difficult after the rain. Yeah. Sorry, sorry about that. I got distracted. I thought I saw just the hint of a leopard pad on the sand. But as I was saying, it's about you have about as much chance as I identifying. Oh, I can't think of something to compare it to. John, can you think of anything? No. Well, that's not a good sign when you're looking for a leopard in front of us. Maybe they're a bit further to the north. So we were just over there when we heard it. I was pretty sure it was in this area, the top of this little river system. And we've got some Inyala there now. Maybe they were heading a bit east. So I'm gonna actually cut, I'm gonna drive out and then go onto the fire break and we'll switch off there and listen again for a while. Um, oh yeah, so yeah, I think I've thought of something. Uh, I said that with the leopard spots and similar markings on their face and stuff like that, chances of being able to identify paternity or maternity from those type of markings uh, is about as likely as identifying where every paper clip in the world was made. Okay, so while we try continue our endeavours after these mating felines, uh, Jamie is with some other felines in the riverbed. Not just the other felines, but also the little cubs that we have since found while you were away. Now the tech team has been battling our gremlins. Look who is sleeping behind a log. Can you see her yet? Because she is very, very difficult to spot. There she is, hidden behind a fallen piece of wood, fast asleep. At least I think it's her. I think it's the female. And then, if we go up along the bank a little bit, I'm just trying to see if you'll be able to see it. If you go a bit to that big tree, Dave, in front of you, on the leftish, there you go. Just keep going, because behind that is leopard cub number two. There you go. You can just, just see some spots there. If you look really carefully in the middle of your screen, there's little breathing leopard spots. And both little ones breathing, breathing, <laughs> breathing very rapidly because they've got incredibly full bellies. Oh, these little cubs have become so much more comfortable around vehicles, but if we try and reposition now, we are going to scare them. And I really, really don't want to do that. We've spent so much time getting them used to us it's just not, it's just disrespectful. So we'll wait for them to wake up a little bit and to start moving around. As I says, as said, as it starts to get cooler, they will start to be more active. But at the moment, they have very full bellies. Hello, little one. I see you. Dave can't see you, but I can see you looking at us. You want to come around this side? <laughs> oh, little one. Just in the wrong place. You can just see an ear poking out over the top of the tree. Come on, little one. Well, we can't really, we definitely won't disturb the afternoon nap of the two little ones. Oh, 
the one hand, they feel as though they've grown so much, but on the other, they still look so very small and vulnerable. They are so utterly adorable. Hey, little munchkins. Just looking back, because the constant sound of chewing, here comes Karula Dev. Constant sound of Karula's chewing has stopped, and she's going to come down the tree. Awesome. Now she's looking for them. She might even call them to her. Yeah, she's chuffing. I love that sound. Chuff, chuff. Hey, big girl. Do you have a very full belly now? I love that. The first thing she does as soon as she comes down the tree after she's finished her meal is to call across to them. And she's probably already figured out exactly where they are. No, perhaps not. She still seems to be looking around. And giving herself a jolly good clean. Now this is a very difficult sighting for Dave, just by the way, just in terms of the lighting. Because Karula keeps plonking herself in the shadows, but with the incredibly bright and sunny light, it is quite tricky, tricky to be able to get the amount of detail that we normally are able to show you. But that's going to change as we spend our afternoon here with this wonderful leopard family. It'll make life a lot easier as the sun starts to set. Go. Fastidiously cleaning off all vestiges of her meal. Any bits of rotten meat that might be clinging to her fur, she will get rid of. Leopards are much more clean animals than lions are. They're a lot more, as I said, fastidious about their general hygiene and condition. But all big cats will, after a kill, after feeding on a kill, they'll spend quite a lot of time cleaning their paws, and in particular their claws. They'll stretch them out and unsheath them and clean around them because the last thing they want is a build-up of meat or grit or dirt around those very sensitive claw sheaths because the, sh the claw fits into the sheath in a very, very smooth and tight way. And if they allow something to get in there, first of all they run the risk of an abscess or infection and also it stops the claw from working as it should. So very, very important for her to keep those feet clean, if nothing else. That being said, you still don't want to cuddle a wild leopard. They are parasite ridden. They've got lots of ticks. They've got lots and lots of intestinal parasites. And all other kinds of things like small parasitic worms swimming in their saliva. You don't really want to handle it with bear, with any cuts here that comes up. He's going to make his way to mom, I think. Come on, little one. You were playing so nicely with mom earlier. Here we go. Oh! Going from one spot to an even less visible spot. Fair enough. What are you doing, little one? that where you're going to stay. In the meantime, it seems as though, from what I can see, unfortunately... Oh, there we go, Shungilo's up. I'm almost certain that's her. Oh, or not. She's going to go flat, too. Hey, Karula, don't you want to give your cubs a call? Tell them to come out and play. We are so privileged to spend time with these animals. Sorry, Dave, I know you've just turned all the way to Karula, but Shungila's just caught... Uh, hold on. She just caught a stick. <laughs> it was really cute. 
She caught that sticking out stick. And she's going to go stalk her brother, I think. Oh, look at that big round belly. I have to tell you something. To me, I think I've been aging leopard cubs wrong my whole guiding career because I've never actually sat with them from such a young age. And I never realized just how small a six-month-old cub truly is. These guys are very, very tiny still. But we know exactly how old the cubs are because Brent found them the day that they were born. And what's interesting to note, though, is the change in, in the way that they respond to things. When they were little cubs, their entire world revolved around their mother. Whenever we saw them with mom, she was the center of their existence. They followed her example, and they hid from everything else. Now, when we're watching them, there's this streak of independent light in their eyes. And whenever they see something like a bird or a squirrel or anything that moves, they're almost constantly on the lookout and alert and curious. And it's all part of their natural development, of course, and the natural aging process. But it is incredible to witness. And Karula calmly looks on. She's been there, done that. This is now her fifth litter of cubs that she's raised to this age. And Chloe, you want to know whether or not the mothers and offspring will keep their, will stay on sort of familiarity terms with each other. You're saying you know that leopards are solitary, but do they ever meet up when they are adults? And yes, actually, we, we enjoyed a sighting, or Brent enjoyed a, enjoyed a sighting a couple of months ago where we had Shadow and Karula on their territorial boundary. I wouldn't, Chloe, I definitely wouldn't have called that a cordial reun reunion. So when they are well and truly adult, well and truly independent, then the females actually growl at each other. They'll tolerate each other and they probably won't fight unless there's cubs involved. But they sort of sat and growled for ages at each other. Karula, of course, one of our favorite stories and one of Brent's most fantastic photos was she blew a giant bubble of spit while she was growling at her daughter. Their sons are a little different. Their sons are treated with slightly more tolerance during the initial stages of their independence and dispersal. And then once they go and once they move off, familiarity in leopard terms can mean a lot of different things. If a female leopard were to encounter her grown-up son and he had become dominant in an area and she was in estrus, she would mate with him. It is just the way that the world works out here. Mm. Very, very different in terms of their basic instincts and not guided by the same morals or whatever values that human beings are guided by. So lions will mate with their own daughters or brothers or sisters and leopards will do the same if they encounter them. That's one of the big reasons why the females stay in an area where they are much more likely to encounter their mother, but the males move off and sometimes even dispersing distances of 200 miles. And welcome to Abigail, who would like to know who this lovely leopard is on her screen. Well, Abigail, it is fantastic to have you on board, and I really hope you are enjoying it. Abigail, this is probably one of the most famous leopards in the entire world. Her name is Karula, which means peace or the peaceful one. She is now 12 years old and, as I was discussing earlier, has probably one of the most successful rates of raising cubs to adulthood of any other leopard that has ever been recorded. She really, truly is a fantastic mom. Very, very successful. So she's got two little bundles of joy with her at the moment, six months old, called Shungile and Hosanna. 
and they are playing hard to get right now. They're playing a little bit camera shy. But Karula, as always, is perfectly comfortable with the presence of the vehicles. And as a result, she has taught her cubs to do so too. And some of our viewers have been watching since basically, or been keeping track of Karula since the day she was born, and have watched a great deal of her life play out on these live safaris. So Abigail, welcome. It is my absolute pleasure and a privilege to introduce you to Karula, a leopard that we probably spend, I would say we spend the most time with in terms of hours out here, and one that we have come to know and love. And her two little ones that I can't really see, but Dave has spotted. I can just see movements and twitching of the ears. <laughs> just little shapes moving behind the trees. We you got it there. Some spots. swishing paws and tail. Oh, what we will do is we will have a chance to reposition, but not just yet. So we'll just wait out, wait for our turn in order to get a better view of these little cubs. And there we go, back to the original topic of conversation, a question from Jane. Um, we discussed the way in which leopard, male leopard cubs disperse farther away from their mothers than the females do. And Jane wants to know how far will a male leopard travel. Um, sometimes, Jane, it's just a matter of a couple of miles. So, for example, Karula's son, Shumbambalana, is not, he's the dominant male leopard towards the Kruger National Park, not at all far away from where we are now, probably in a straight line a distance of four or so miles, just about seven kilometers, if you, depending on which system you're working in, and of course my miles conversion is always atrocious. And then, the one of the biggest recorded distances was from the a park in the Krizulu National Tell. No, that, none of that sentence came out right. Krizulu Natal, one of the national parks in Krizulu Natal, um, Shishlui Umfulozi, a male leopard was recorded dispersing from his mother to Kruger National Park, which is a distance of roughly 500 or so odd kilometers, no more, it must be about 800 or so kilometers, mm, let's say 600 kilometers. So they can disperse an enormous distance, because of course until they find a vacuum, a territorial vacuum, or until they are strong enough to compete for territory, they'll just keep moving until they manage to get large enough to defend their own area. And then sometimes they get lucky. Karula's son Kunuma is busy mating with one of the females on Londolozi at, what's he, three and a half? Maybe nearly four? How interesting is that? He just happened to find himself in a really truly good position the lions killed a dominant male leopard in that area, and Kunuma snuck in. But one thing that I have heard about, I've never seen him, or I have, I've seen him once, but very briefly. But the one thing I have heard in terms of stories of Kunuma is that he has no shortage of attitude. Quarantine as well, growling at his older brother at a very young age. It's interesting. I suspect the mating leopard is Gijima. Sorry, just a little aside from my thought pattern. I think perhaps that mating leopard is Gijima. And that he is... Now, Gijima is a very, very skittish male leopard. Which might make him a bit harder to find. And if he runs, even if he's mating with Shaluva, who's relatively relaxed... If he runs away, she will follow him. And Drakistis, 
who is a new viewer. Just bear with me one second. Are you off? Do you want me to move? <laughs> My cub apparently is up again. I can't see it. Sorry, Dricky Space, who is a new viewer. Welcome. It's so special to have you on board. I'm glad we could present you with this amazing sighting that we are enjoying on a Friday afternoon. And Dricky, well, you said, well, we give the leopards names with a, bit, with a question mark. Um, how do we know which is which? And the answer is officially, scientifically, each and every leopard spot, every leopard has a unique spot pattern, both just in terms of the arrangement of their spots, and also, on a slightly closer level of examination, the top row of their whisker spots will have either two, three, or four dots to them. And so they became, they become known as sort of the three, four female, or the four, four female, in one particular area. That being said, Ricky, it honestly gets to the point where you spend so much time with these animals, watching them, that you actually know them almost straight away, just from their look. They start to look as different to you as different people do. It's an interesting effect, but it really is, I found it to be absolutely true. The more time you spend with them, for example, I'm pretty sure that I could come upon three lionesses and immediately know that they are the Unkuhumas and not the sticks, just by looking at them. Okay, as soon as Ephraim has moved a little way away, then we can switch on and reposition for the cubs. I'm just waiting. I don't want two engines or two vehicles on at the same time in the sighting. It just minimizes the amount of noise interference that happens in these cat li cats' lives. So, Dricky, wonderful to have you. I'm also pleased to introduce you and Abigail and all our new viewers to the lovely Queen Karula. A leopard that, as I said, we've come to know very, very well. All right. Now, speaking of Queen Karula and her little delicious monsters, or whatever it else it is that Brent calls them, because it just amuses me so much. He's definitely soppier than I am when it comes to baby leopards and lions. We're going to go forward a little bit and see if we can't get a different view. Where are you, you little monsters? Where'd you go? Aha! I see you. I see you. Sorry, Dave, we're gonna have to, I think, just tell me if you can see them from this angle. A little bit more, you say? Just a bit further into the thorn tree, you mean? Cool. <laughs> um, I found myself in a precarious position right now, but that's okay. It's worth it for this view. Hello, little ones. Are you exhausted? So much growing and so much eating over the last 24 hours. Two very content little leopard cubs are fast asleep. And just by the way, there are other vehicles wanting to come into the sighting, but Andrew will, or oh sorry, Mike will only be able to come into the sighting once Ephraim has moved off Juma. And there's a sort of, there's an order to the way in which vehicles can come in, so we're not keeping anybody's spot in this particular moment. We're just enjoying some time spent with them. The other guys have rushed off to look for Cheetah around Buffelsook. Yeah, such a picture of, of contentment. Just one little ear twitching every now and again. The f male in the front and the female at the back. And you can actually really see the difference in size. And Darlene, absolutely there is a difference between leopard cubs and lion cubs that you've picked up on and observed. The little lion cubs that we have are much more boisterous and they seem to have almost non-stop energy 
They're constantly barreling about, well, almost constantly barreling about doing something. There's definitely a contrast with the leopards. They are much less, as you said, they're a bit more introverted and a bit more retiring. And that is instinctive. That's a difference in character. Because if you think about it, a leopard is a secretive creature. It's a secretive, solitary, almost lonely figure. Although, of course, that is the way that they have evolved and prefer it. Whereas in the complete opposite, lions are 100% social cats. The company of their pride members will be a staple sort of security for their entire lives. It's not something that the leopard cubs will have to enjoy. Now, I don't know what extent sibling recognition happens or recognition of their family once they grow up. I think they probably know each other and tolerate each other. But they ultimately are destined for, unless for the female, when she has cubs, they're pretty much destined for a solitary life. So what's the point in... Oh, <laughs> I forgot that there were thorns there. <laughs> That was um, <laughs> unpleasant. It's okay. There's a. Uh, I've been leaning over my monitor. I forgot that there was a thorn tree behind me. I'm um, in the thorn tree. It's okay. Not a problem. It was just that one branch happened to spear me in the back. Here we go. Solved. Problem solved. <laughs> so yes, there is a very big difference, Darlene, in terms of our little leopard cub's behaviour. Uh, it sounds as though Brent is calling in reinforcements in order to help him out. And I also need to get onto the Game Drive channel to find out who is coming here next and when they are planning on arriving. Uh, I'm going to hop onto the Game Drive channel, and while I do, let's go back to Brent, who is also searching for spotted cats. So we are indeed searching for spotted cats, but two varieties. We're looking for spotted little lion cubs at the moment. Herbert found the den. I think it's here. I'm just having a look at Herbie's tracks. And he told me... And I can see his tracks here. He said there's a little drainage line, so I think the lion cubs might be in there. So I just want to see if Mom's here. And it's also very close to where... We heard those leopards. Okay, we did say it was quite steep around these parts. Okay, let's see if we can spot a little lion cub, a little spotty creature. Now, for me, I think we're looking in the wrong place. See where Herbie's track's gone. I don't believe she would have put the cubs there. This is actually quite a big elephant path, so it could be a bit of a danger coming through here for those cubs. Let's have a closer look at where Herb's tracks went. Well, I'm incredibly lucky with all the cubs around at the moment. Yeah, I can see it. There we go. There's Herb's tracks. Oh, they go down there. And tr Let's just make it up to the shore. Yeah. Let's see the tracks. Oh, it looks like he just turned around here. Maybe he was looking for a way to get in. You see any vehicle tracks your side there, John Ray? No, he brought the car in. Have a look to see if he can get a car into this lion den. No vehicle tracks here. Let's just have a look, have a look from that high ground. I'm following his directions to the, the T. You go straight from that small leadwood. You will see my Nemo and Gonzo, my vehicle tracks. Just 
checking in that Timbretti thicket. I don't see anything there. Apparently our, our vehicle sounds like it's roaring while we're in low range so uh, lots of talk. Okay. And here's Herbie's tracks that come in here. Don't quite go to the let's just have a look. Maybe if we have a look down off this little cliff edge. I'm not sure what he's talking about. Trying to listen to see if I can hear any of those little lion cub sounds they make when mom's around. Hmm. Nope. But this is a beautiful spot. As I said, it's one of my favorite areas to walk is down here. Conundrums, conundrums. Well, anyhow, well, we'll have to ask Herbie tomorrow where the iron cubs are. But if they are down in the base there, we're unfortunately not going to get a vehicle in there. It is incredibly thick and with that steep bank, not even our wonderful little vehicles. And they're so good at off-roading, going to be able to get down there. Just have a look. The herb didn't try and go in over here with a bit of a spit. It doesn't look like it. Nope. So we're going to keep checking for those leopards. I'm going to do another loop around this block and see what else we might see on our loop. So we've got some spies out there looking for the leopards. So we saw there's a, some baboons moving through there. There's some kudu, there's some manyara, there's some impala. So if those leopards uh, pop out somewhere over there, uh, we've got a good chance that one of those creatures will see them and start alarm calling. Now, what often happens with mating leopards for some reason, as we scour and search for them, uh, sort of as drive ends, they pop out at the Juma Dam Cam. So, who knows, keep a lookout on the Juma Dam Cam. Uh, you know, after after drive, they might pop there for a little visit. And in my reinforcements, it looks like Ephraim. Uh, Eph's also trying to help me find these leopards. So if he's waiting down here, I'm going to go up to the other side. Oh, hey. Hello, everyone. Hi, Ev. Hi, Ev. You good? Thanks to yourself, Mbo. Yes, Bazan, Mbo. I heard them twice and then nothing for an hour. Middle of this block. I, I even drive into the block and I've been I was sat there for half an hour. Might be sometime you didn't, you didn't cross your bubble suit. I didn't check the boundary. I came to check this uh, in Gala Den now, but uh, Herbie and William found it in Yao. Oh. But you can't get more. <laughs> Not even these movers, you can't get there. Nah. Uh, so I'm going to share now. Oh, okay. And then last and Gomez were somewhere in this block as in well. This yeah. morning, yeah. 
Hey, there's an Ingwe is so much team that well. Who do you think it is? Mvula. Yeah, because Mvula here, Andrew was in Mvula last night. Was crossing in to... Okay. Yeah. Okay, so... Playing somewhere around. Maybe we'll get lucky. I'll go around this way. Uh, I'm going to go around the Mvubu. Okay, thank you. Okay. Cheers, good luck. Cheers, bye-bye. Cheers, everyone. Bye. 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 <laughs> We had a few um, photographers on that vehicle. Okay, sorry. I, I know there was a question, but I started yapping with Ephraim there. Ah, oh, hey! Haley would like to know what my favorite part of Juma is. Oh, Haley, that's a difficult one. I think I've got a few favorite parts. I would say definitely that, that little river system we've just been looking into. And the section of the Mawati River here from uh, where you can't drive anymore up to behind the, the Juma da or the Vuyatela Dam. Uh, that's exactly the area where Karula is at the moment. Mm. Where else? Yes, no, I think those are my two fa- Oh! And the little uh, drainage system between Ledward Road and... and... Mumba Road. And then on Cheetah Plains, there's no doubt which my favourite area is. It's that... that buff skull pan area. And you've got that red soil, those big Ledward trees, magnificent gardenia. So we're going back towards where we first heard those leopards mating. Now if we do have any new viewers, leopards mating has such a distinct sound, you can't really confuse it with anything in the bush. It sounds something like this. So, very distinct. Lions is a bit deeper. Hopefully we'll find some very active and vigorous leopards uh, in the quite near future. So while we do that, let's go have a look at some not so active little leopards. Remember the time where Brent asked everybody to send through their best impression of a mating leopard sound? And as always, our viewers were terribly good sports and sent through some amazing little videos and screenshots and whatever it was that they sent it through. It was hilarious. But as Brent said, our little leopard cubs are currently, I would describe, we would definitely describe them as flat cats. It's exhausting work doing all of that growing, particularly when you've got a full belly of impala. Time to settle and rest as we wait for it to get a little bit cooler. And Marga from Rosenberg, a really interesting point. Marga's point is, do I think that perhaps the ex slightly more extended lactation period of lions might account for the fact that they've got slightly more energy since they milk contains proteins and obviously is, first of all, much easier to digest um, in terms of its contents. It's much easier for the little leopard cubs or little cubs to absorb. And then obviously doesn't... Um, they, they get have very easy access to it. It's a very good point. The time spent suckling for lion cubs is not that much longer than leopard cubs though. But I do think that there's slightly more extended absences from the mother. So I think that your point is entirely valid. When these two were little, they spent considerable periods of time, as they all, all leopard cubs do, up to 
two days at a time without their mother coming back to feed them. Whereas it seems as though, from what we've observed with the Nkuhumas, they seem to go back at least once a day to go and feed them. Um, so I think that might also, it's a good point, they're a little bit younger, the lion cubs, and they're still suckling, so that might explain the extra energy. But I really, really think that the social aspect of it plays a huge difference in terms of their behavior and their attitude. I mean, look, we have seen these cubs play and boisterously bumble over each other and keep themselves thoroughly entertained. And as they start to grow older, they will also be thoroughly entertaining. We spent hours with Sindile just watching him do silly cub things, like climb into trees and fall out of them, or catch a dwarf mongoose, one very memorable sighting. But they're just doing what, and this is probably what the lion cubs would be doing if they'd just eaten a very big meal as well. Resting secretly in the drainage line, not drawing attention to themselves, just enjoying a little moment of peace. And as it starts to get cooler, and we also see it in their tracks in the roads the next day after they have wandered around and about, and you can see where the cubs have been dashing all over the show, backwards, forwards, over mom's track, probably, and you can kind of picture in your mind when you see those little footprints left in the sand, you can picture the sighting with a little cub gambling around and then running up to mom and rubbing up against her as they do. Oh, big stretch. Now, I, this is, I know that Brent was discussing one of his favorite areas. This really, truly is one of mine as well. Sitting in this Mawati drainage line, it does certainly help that we have a family of leopards with us to keep us entertained. But even if we didn't, sitting here and sort of, I don't know, wheedling away the hours would be thoroughly pleasant in this particular spot. It smells fresh and clean starting to get slightly cooler but it was nice and shady from the warm afternoon protected from the warm afternoon I mean it really truly is one of my favorite spots and clearly it's one of Karula's favorites as well and the constant harsh call of a bushrike it was what you might be hearing <laughs> as I said that it went completely quiet of course that's a bit of Murphy's Law in there. Right, well, since our leopard cubs are being so thoroughly... Oh, we've got a foot movement. Stop the press. We've got some movement. One foot's gone up on a log. so cute <laughs> and Sarah Sharp it's wonderful to have you with us I hope you are enjoying the sighting of our lovely leopards now Sarah it's a good question Sarah says her topic is a little bit ra or her question is a little bit random and off topic but it was will any of the birds utilize the fur from the carcass to line their nests or to use it as sort of nest building material Sarah that's a really good question because yes some of the birds will do that they will go and pick away tufts of fur that they happen to find and they will use it as nest building material. I have even heard of birds plucking fur out of basically the hairballs that the big cats cough up, which is kind of gross actually when you think about it. But I have heard of that happening. I don't think it's all that common though. But yes, birds will go down and pick up and utilize the hair of the carcass for lining their nests and I can't think of a specific species that would do that I don't think the raptor species really do it but I, I'm sure some of the smaller passerines will particularly obviously they won't not many of the birds are breeding at the moment but they will start to in the next few months as we go into spring Jean-Dre laughed at me this morning when I said I was full of the joys of spring he told me that it's not spring. I just, I disagree. It feels like spring. It's not really, though. It's just the end of winter is slowly coming into sight. Okay, sleepy cats. Shall we go see your mum instead? 
I think so. Let's go see since the light is so beautiful. Let's go and have a look at the mother of our two lovely creatures. And in that, while we reposition the vehicle and get a different view of Karula, let us head jump back onto the back of Rusty. Couldn't remember which car I was on for a second. Let's jump back onto the back of the vehicle with Brent and find out how his search is going. So we're still in search of these leopards they are giving us a real run around. Uh, I'm thinking they might have then cut maybe northwest from where we heard them. So we're going to go check the top side of Mvubu Road. Fingers crossed. So I just got the report that there's a, another dead elephant in Buffalo's Hook. So I, it's going to be interesting to see whether the Nkuhumas head there. With those little cubs, even if they go to that carcass, they might just feed for a day and then get out. The reason for this is because those cubs are so young and a carcass like an elephant will draw all the hyenas or if there's any nomadic male lions in the area. So it's a risky area to have young cubs. So if they do, they'll go feed for a day and then get out of dodge. So what I might do now, I'm going to do one last circle of this block and if we get no luck, I'm going to remove myself from the area, go to Buffles Hook waterhole and then come back a little bit later, hopefully as it gets cooler they might start mating a little bit more frequently, Ooh, the sun's still quite bright. Mating leopards can move big distances, especially if there's a male on his territorial route. So what will happen is he'll be, oh yeah, I'm patrolling and the female will want to mate. So she'll basically follow him on his territorial marking route and I think that could be what's happening here. This could be Gajima. So we're checking a bit further to the west, no luck to the west, I want to check further east towards Buffalo's Hook and maybe just have a look around the Buffalo's Hook waterhole, might be some eddies, and just a change of scenery because we've spent the whole drive in this very small area and maybe those leopards snuck out while we weren't listening carefully. We're very, very warm at Safari Live. Welcome to Martha. Martha is a brand new viewer at the young age of 82. So welcome Martha. Uh, Martha's question is, she would like to know, do animals, oh, bumpy, bumpy there, uh, display any different behavior around full moon? Yes, but probably not the type of behavior you're thinking. So full moon is actually the worst time of the month for the predators, uh, uh, for their hunting. It makes it a little bit harder for them because it's not, uh, it's very bright. So that ambient light gives the prey species like impala and kudu and inyala, all the, all the antelope and, and zebra, a better chance at spotting a potential predator. So. Uh, they're a little, the, the antelope or the herbivores are a bit more relaxed. Oh, I keep talking a lot in my ear, Martha, I do apologize. I'm going to turn it down so I can concentrate on answering your question. Okay, there we go. So, as I was saying, so the, 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 the prey species or the herbivores, the, the grass and leaf eaters, tend to be a little bit more relaxed over full moon uh, predators tend to move a lot more over full moon and that's because they're not as successful at hunting. 
Uh, I hope that answers your question, Martha. And I hope you continue to join us on these live African drives. So what I'm doing now is I'm double checking our northern boundary to make sure those leopards didn't skedaddle out. It is beautiful out here. Now, everyone's got their favorite time of the year. And uh, strangely enough, uh, well, not strange enough, a lot of people love the summer months. It's green, there are flowers everywhere, lots of brightly colored migratory birds. But for me, I don't know, there's something about the dry season. Uh, the colors in the leaves and uh, the light at this time of the year with all the dust. So, I don't know, for me, this is my favorite time of the year, probably culminating in October being my most favorite month to be in the bush. But we'll chat about why a little later, because I don't want to keep you away from those wonderful little lemons. Well, I couldn't agree more. I think that this is my favorite time of year to be in the bush as well. And you get to enjoy amazing sightings such as this one. Unfortunately, we are going to have to leave at some point relatively soon. I'm just waiting for the other vehicles to get here and then we will pull out and leave Aubrey and Mike to enjoy this moment. We can't really keep it all to ourselves, can we? And for now, our leopards are not up to anything too active. The cubs are still fast asleep in their little cub puddle a little bit behind us and Karula is sleeping off a very full belly. Oh, she's got even more flat now. <laughs> Amazing. She's practically disappeared. She lies down. Just a twitch of the ear gives her away. This goes to show how tricky it can be to find leopards, especially a leopard like Karula. She's marvelously relaxed on foot, for which we are exceptionally grateful for. But you can walk within 20 meters of her and not see her. Because she doesn't lift her head, she's so used to people, she might be lying down flat like this, and you could be forgiven for walking straight past her. And while she's sleeping like this, I wanted to just take the opportunity to show you this amazing tree that she is growing next to the tree that she hoisted the impala kill in. Have a look at this. A boer bean tree has been sort of knocked sideways either through elephant action or actually by the line or sort of the the sand being washed away by flowing water it looks as though to me the bank has collapsed but the root system has managed to clutch on because it's entangled in the roots of the tree next to it and it's managed to stay like that and amazingly i mean this must have happened quite a long time ago because amazingly when you look along it you can actually see the branches of all the it's basically got new trunks now it's got two new trunks growing straight up vertically outside of it obviously the, the leaves reaching up towards the sun so naturally it's grown up vertically but it is a really interesting example of just how resilient trees can be out here now we often watch the elephants munching away at them and we wonder how they could possibly be any trees left if each elephant is consuming between 200 to 300 kilograms of food a day and yet here we go we've got this tree that is growing up from where it has collapsed almost completely what do you think of that Karula? I think she definitely thinks that's the most fascinating thing she's heard in a while she's clearly intrigued and wants to know more We've been incredibly fortunate to spend the amount of time that we have. <laughs> oh, you're welcome to come, Mike. Uh, come through. I'll stay until you get here so I can point out where the cubs are as well, because they're quite hidden. Mike just making sure that it's okay for him to come into the sighting. That's something that is standard practice out here. 
So you do it in order to basically make sure that the guide in question is watching the animal's behavior and he's keeping an eye on whatever it is that's happening. So if the animal is upset or showing signs of nervousness, then the guide can actually say, no, don't come in. It's time for you to stop. Uh, Mike, if you look to your right as you come through, you'll see the cubs there, just by the thorn tree, if you look to the right there. The other right. <laughs> there we go. Just pointing them out for him. <laughs> Sorry. Copy. Oops, I will pull out for you. So an awesome sighting has come to an end and I'm giggling, I'm sorry, I'm having a good chuckle because I'm watching the guests <laughs> trying to escape the thorn trees, which, you know, I've just had very, very clear experience with in terms of it poking me very gently in the shoulder blade. Now we'll say goodbye to Karula and her cubs. We will be back first thing on the sunrise safari tomorrow morning to find out if they're still in this area, if the carcass has survived the night in the tree and if it hasn't, where our lovely leopards have gone. While I try and escape this drainage line system, which involves some interesting driving, I'm going to send you back across to Brent, and he can update you on what his plans are for the rest of the afternoon. So we decided to just leave that area. Oh, there we go, well spotted. Not an animal that sits still very long. And that one is not sitting still. Oh, wait, there we go. Let's just... Gotcha! Hello, little female diker. So what looks to be a unicorn is actually a tuft of hair. Or we can pretend that a female diker is a Juma's... Un... It's, it's a dwarf unicorn. Definitely. A dwarf unicorn, very rare. And of course, I'm only playing it as a... a, a grey diker or diker. Uh, also, sometimes in East Africa they call it a Grimm's bush diker. The totem animal, animal of the Tswana people. And uh, specifically the Kama family in Botswana. And that's the president, uh, Ian Kama. Now, his great, 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 I think it's three greats, or could it be four? Gonna have to forgive me a great here or there. Grandfather was being hounded by the Ndabele, which were an offshoot of the Zulu. He decided to, to escape from Shaka, but there was a big regiment of warriors and they moved through South Africa up into the north and then eventually settled in Zimbabwe in a town called Bulawayo. But one of their favorite pastimes is raiding the neighbors and uh, attacking them, taking cows and women was the two main reasons for raids. And Chief Kama, who was the, or the king of the Tswana people, uh, was got caught out by a, a, an impi, and an impi is like a regiment of uh, Zulu or Ndebele warriors. And he was running for his life across these massive open grasslands that are on the edge of the Kalahari Desert. And in the middle of them, there's these Hebeklava, Acacia Hebeklava thickets. And they basically form like an umbrella. And so a lot of animals burrow in and live underneath there. And Chief Karma dived into one of these thorn thickets. And he just was so fatigued, he couldn't run anymore. And he was trying to hide from those Indabello warriors. Here we go, we've arrived at Buffel's Hook. And there's one lone hippopotamus. Bachelor Boba. Although I do fear we have many Bachelor Bobs that use this in timeshare. I'm not sure it's the same one every time. But while we look at Bob marinating in the mud of Buffalo's Hook waterhole. I'll 
finish the story on Chief Karma. So he dived into this acacia thicket and was lying very still at the base. And he was convinced that the Indabele warriors were going to find him. And what happened is he saw a little tiger in the thicket and it didn't run from him. So basically the Indabele warriors ran around and they knew he must be close, putting spears into the thickets and they got to the thicket that Chief Karma was hiding in and the diker burst and ran out and then Debele said, well, he can't be hiding in there because the little Munti or Punti, Puti, Puti in, in Debele uh, has, has come out of there so he wouldn't be hiding there. But of course he was and he survived and eventually went on to get help from none other than David Livingston's father-in-law who ran the mission at Mafakeng. And here we go, John Ray is following some blacksmith lapwings who seem to be chasing a little three-banded plover. I'm not sure why, but that lapwing has decided it really wants to chase that three-banded plover. Lovely camera work, John Ray. Where's the poor little three-banded plover? Oh, there's a Cape turtle dove having a drink. Oh, if you, up the top of blacksmith lap wings. So, a little bit top right. There we go, you got there. Um, where have you gone? There we go, there's chasing the plover. The other little three-banded plover. There we go, whom! Shame. Talk about being a bully. Picking on something an eighth of your size. Oh, next one coming in. Wow. Again, chasing the plover. They well, don't really compete, do we? <laughs> Shame, little. Whoa, look at that. I've never seen that before. And they're carrying on. I wonder what that plover said. Was the blacksmith just being a bully? <laughs> And they're behind the tree now. Is it chasing? The, yeah, it's still chasing the plover. That poor little three-banded plover might as well choose another water hole to go. Oh, still going. Maybe the, the blacksmith lap brings a board and think it's a game. Oh, I can see a pincer maneuver happening between the lap wings. Well, it looks like they're tired of chasing the poor little three-banded plover now. I didn't see if he landed or he... No, they're still chasing it at the back. Shame. So there's a zoom center frame. I'll follow that, yeah. Yo! Hi, James Dungan. He says, perhaps the lapwings have a nest there. It is possible, but uh, there's no reason to chase a little three-banded plover. It poses no threat to their nest at all. And also, when they chase things from their nest, they're quite vocal. <laughs> this, this poor plover. Or maybe that I can hear some geese flying in, but we're going to stick with the, the lapwing plover. It's almost like a ballet. You almost imagine running on tiptoes. Looks like they're both tired of flying. Shame that little plover has to take about five steps on those little legs for every step that the, the lap wing makes. Oh, has the plover... Nope. <laughs> Oh, 
Oh, there we go. All three bandits managed to put some distance between the two. Oh, no. Here we come. Fascinating. Now, I mean, they could compete for food, but very, very little. I mean, the lapwings are much, much bigger. Shame. This is so strange. Oh, that wing's stopping for a snack. He decided to give up on the persecution of plovers. No. Nope. Plover persecution continues. Just needed some uh, mid persecution snacking. Oh, Plum is having some snacking. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, have you escaped, little plumber? Uh, dispatch, he's a brand new viewer. Welcome, Dispatch, says poor little plover. Oh, has the plover given the lapwing the slip? He's running the wrong way. The, the, the plover went the other way, Chief. <laughs> well, that was, that, was, that was highly entertaining and very, very interesting. So while that was going on, a pair of Egyptian geese landed out on the edge of the water. There we go. Hello. Goose. Now, one of the most widespread aquatic waterfowl in Africa. And, of course, the first place they were described from. They're actually in Egyptian hieroglyphics. That's where they get their name from. So in the pyramids, there are pictures of Egyptian geese. And they occur over almost every major body of water in Africa, from all the way from the Nile uh, down here to southern Africa, right down to Cape Town. A few spots in the Central African rainforest where we, you don't find them, but on the east coast and, and then also in the north in the Sahel regions, if there's water, you will find an Egyptian goose. Now, they are grazers, so they actually eat grass. And uh, the golf course industry has actually caused their numbers to boom. Bye bye, hippopotami. And the other feathered creatures. So, on every golf course in Africa, you will find probably 100 pairs of Egyptian geese. The lovely manicured fairways are perfect grazing platform for the Egyptian goose. So we're going to start slowly making our way back towards where we heard the leopards earlier. Hopefully they've come out of the block or decided to be a little bit more vocal. And in the meantime, uh, let's see Jamie, who's managed uh, to extricate herself from the Mawati Riverbed. Extricated with minimal injuries to Dave and myself, and we've come racing through to the Juma Dam to have a look at an animal that we don't often get to see in the form of some chukma baboons. I say we don't often get to see them, it's only in the last few months that we've been really enjoying sightings with this particular fascinating little animal. Now, it is such a pity that they are so far away. We cannot drive off-road for them to get any closer. So at the moment, unfortunately, this is the view that we are going to have to enjoy of our baboon troop. But a distant view of baboons is better than none. As they sit and groom themselves, closely associated with an impala herd. And as Brent said, 
the spies of the bush, and the baboons are no different to the monkeys and impala and inyala. Very, very alert, constantly looking out, and usually one or two of the big dominant males in the group will be keeping, playing the role of sentry in watching out for their families. So a fascinating social structure, completely unlike most of the other animal herds or groups that we see, kind of in a way similar to lions, although not quite. Each baboon troop is, has a system with, that is known as oligarchy, where the couple of big males are actually the dominant members of that group, and they share that dominance. They might, they probably you find that one is the bigger, the biggest and the strongest, but for the most part it is a relatively well-established one where they don't compete for access to females, Instead, they have their own prepared female, sort of favorite females that they spend time with and groom and mate with and produce offspring with. And you'll even find that they've been nicknamed godfathers because they will, when it's their favorite female, they will even care for an offspring that isn't theirs. Make sure that they protect it from the attentions of other females that occasionally get a little bit too rough and rowdy with the youngsters and ultimately currying favour with their preferred lady friend, or a few preferred lady friends, I should say. The females have a social hierarchy of their own. There'll be higher ranking and lower ranking ones. Now, baboons have some of the largest sexual dimorphism of any animals out here. So a male baboon is roughly twice the size and weight of a female. Much, much larger. And baboons out here also tend to be really very skittish. So we usually only manage to spend a bit of time with them watching from quite a long distance view. And unfortunately, unless they decide to go towards the Galago Pan, it might be really tricky for us to get another glimpse of them. They seem to have vanished for now, but that's okay, because we have other things at the Pan to keep us occupied. And there's Nyala over there, right at the back near the lodge. The impala are starting to gather, and of course, all sorts of animals now coming through to have a drink. The impala scampering around. You are, by the way, also looking, if you were to be able to look into the bush about uh, sort of 20 or so meters, you would see the lovely ladies in final control. So they're not far from us at all. Apparently they're waving to us, but... um. We're not quite that we're not that quite well equipped to to be able to put them on camera. But yes, that is where final control is. And the impala herd what are they looking at? Some of them have been their attention's been attracted to something, but it's most likely other impala. They tend to be hyper cautious, which makes total sense. Particularly with the smell of lions pervading the air. And then it's not just these animals, there's also two wildebeest sitting watching and waiting for their opportunity to go and have a drink. Hello boys, would you like me to move back a little bit? Perhaps that would make your life a little easier. I say boys, even though they're together, just my impression, I haven't stopped to look at them properly, I might be mistaken about that. But they both look like males to me, with their solid black faces, rather than having a strip of brown around the top of their forehead. Also, their horns much broader than the span of their ears. The tip of the ear stops before the end of the curve, upward curve of the horn. These are blue wildebeest, also known in some places as gnus, which is a ridiculous name in my opinion. Now, unfortunately, as much as we would like it to be, I do not think that this is Gnormless Nor Gnorman, or however on earth you say it, and Normal Norman, joining up and joining forces. We're a little bit far from Cheetah Plains for it to be Gnorm whatever his name is, Gnormless Norman. Oh, goodness. Brent and his naming. <laughs> Those were Brent's names for his wildebeest. <laughs> But no, I don't think that this is normal Norman, <coughs> oops, excuse me, and normless Norman joining forces. Hello, boys. 
I was going to try and move backwards to make their passage to the water a little bit easier because I think they're nervous with us here. So what we'll do is we'll actually go forward and turn around so that we're not blocking their view to the dam. They can approach and feel a bit more comfortable. Obviously, I don't want to make them feel uncomfortable and like they can't come and drink. That goes entirely contrary to the way in which we approach doing these drives, where we try and have as little impact on the animal as possible. Hello, Dam Cam. And a lovely message coming through from Dispatch, who is a new viewer. Now, Dispatch has put up a screen grab of the Impala and the baboons together and has said how amazing it is how there's such a diverse number of species that are able to coexist and sort of help each other out. And that's exactly right. Of all of the animals that you find with baboons, it's very, very common to find Impala. First of all, it's many eyes means extra safety. There you go, boys. Is that a little bit better? It is indeed two males, just by the way. So dispatch absolutely. And what you'll often find is when, during the fruiting season, and the jackalberries are starting to get fruits, what the baboons will do is they'll go up into the trees and forage, and the impala will hang around underneath them to pick up any of the fruit that they happen to drop. Panic. As our wildebeest settle in to drink, providing us with a truly beautiful scene. Ellen, in Arkansas, lovely to have you as always. You wanted to know whether or not the baboons would ever attack the impala or any of the other animals. Not at this time of year, Ellen. It's relatively uncommon. So baboons are fascinating, and I'm sure this is what you're thinking along the lines of, in that they are they're omnivores that are capable of hunting, particularly the big male baboons. A couple of big male baboons with canines longer than Karula's are a fearsome team, and some baboons have learned to hunt. In the lambing season, they can potentially snatch up and grab a baby impala. There are records of it happening. Sorry, I was just struggling with the dust and the allergies. <laughs> that was a very short drink. Hey, Vildies. Are we done already? I really enjoy spending time with wildebeest. They're fascinating animals. So, Ellen, yes, there is a chance. It's unlikely, especially at this time of year. But with brand new lambs, there are certain baboon troops that have learned to hunt them as a potential food source. And I have never seen it myself, but I have seen photographs of it, and I can imagine it's actually quite heart-wrenching to witness, because there's that trust level between the impala and the baboons that then gets completely, obviously, undervalued. There's even a case recently, and I mean this is a total exception to the rule, of a warthog killing a baby impala. Now, we don't know what provoked that, we will never know what provoked that, but it did actually settle down and feed on it a bit. Warthogs, like all pigs, and in fact some of the antelope species as well, will supplement their diet with meat every now and again. But the idea of a warthog actively hunting a baby impala is a really very strange one. I thought that was a short drink. You can't possibly be done. It's okay, you can go back. Now, speaking of baboons, I know we're look at watching the wildebeest, but we've got lots of baboon questions because we don't often see them. We have a lovely question from Michelle, which is, why do the baboons walk with their a sort of a third of their tail upright and then two-thirds drooping down? And that's a very valid question. The interesting thing about that, Michelle, and I don't know 100% how one goes about it, but you can actually age a baboon by looking at the portion of the tail that droops. So the older they get, from what I understand from my reading, the older a baboon gets, the more the tail starts to droop in a strange way. And once they are adults, they are, they've got that sort of stiffened portion. 
As to why it is structured in that way, are we having a roll? Let's go forward a bit. I wondered where all that dust came from all of a sudden. I was going to ask Dave how he managed to get his, his lens so dirty. Ah, oh, awesome. Yay, look how much fun this wildebeest is having. Sorry, Michelle, we'll get back to your question in a moment. I love watching them do this. He even rubbed his pre-orbital glands on the ground first. Oh, there he goes, doing it again. Is he going to scrape his feet for us as well? And I think what we have here is this is the territorial bull. The territorial male wildebeest, and they do hold their own territories. However, I think he's tolerant of the other male, because the other male is behaving in a submissive manner, not marking territory. It's much smaller than he is, and I think that's the reason. It's often, often wildebeest do reach a bit of a truce around a water hole or a water point, so they'll allow others, other males to come in and have a drink, as provided they don't start marking territory or anything like that. Oh, and there's even some dwarf mongoose, for those of you who are eagle-eyed. They're settling down for the night, keeping a close eye on the comings and goings of the waterhole. Oh, the stories these dwarf mongoose could tell, I'm sure. The things they've seen happening around the Juma Pan. And off goes our wildebeest. Oh! <laughs> All the dwarf mongoose disappearing. One head popped out briefly. And off our Voldy goes. Into the vegetation. Michelle, back to your question, now that our wildebeest are disappearing, on the subject of the baboon's tails, which are, of course, very different. They're not as... I know what you're trying... I know what you're asking, because really they're not like monkey tails at all, at all are they? The monkey tails give off an impression of dexterity and almost being ut utilized as an extra limb. A baboon's tail is not quite like that. So they've obviously evolved differently and they obviously don't use their tails as much in terms of an assistant in terms of climbing and balance and holding on in the way that monkeys do. Now, it's interesting, it's a good point that you raise. I don't know why it is that the baboon's tail kind of goes and then droops down. Um, perhaps it's just the design of the baboon, it's much more balanced that way. And as with any animal, it plays a very, very important role in their social communication. But it's definitely not as movable as a monkey's tail. And just like that, everybody's gone. The impala have gone, the wildebeest have gone, the dwarf mongoose have gone to sleep. And I think it's time for us to move on. Perhaps we'll encounter the, ba the baboons as they start to settle down, because they're going to be looking for a nice big tree in which to spend the night. And in fact, they're probably up there already, settling down for the evening. I'm just going to wrap a scarf. It's starting to get chilly. But while I add a few layers before we set off on our search, let us go back onto the back of Rusty and see how Brent's evening is going. Well, my evening is going very well, apart from the fact that these leopards have uh, eluded us. I'm, I'm hoping now that it's a bit cooler. They might be mating more frequently or get a little bit thirsty. So if they haven't gone west, I mean east, they must have gone west. Can't find any tracks to the north. I think we're going to check a little bit further to the west. And as Jamie was saying, the temperature has dropped quite a bit. Find my jacket for a bit of warmth. Now, Jamie's been sitting at the Juma Dam, so if those leopards were around here, she probably would have heard them. So I think we need to expand our search. Hi, Michelle. Michelle says, weren't you just at Bifulsuk Dam? Isn't there supposed to be a dead elephant there? 
Now, Michelle, I can understand your, your confusion a little bit. Um, there is indeed a dead elephant, but that elephant is in Buffel's Hook. Now, we're on Juma, which is actually known as Gowrie. Uh, Buffel's Hook Dam is near the Buffel's Hook boundary, but the dead elephant is in Buffel's Hook, which is the property to the north of us. Standing by. I'm gonna do Mvubu shortcut off shortcut Gallagher. Uh, sorry, let me just cancel that. I'm gonna do the cut line up towards Sydney's in case those animals went west. Um, I don't know if you want to check around Galago Pan. Okay, so Jamie's joining in in the hunt for the mating leopards. Okay, are you ready to be bounced around? This is possibly the bumpiest section of road in the whole of Juma. So here we go. Fighting the steering wheel. Of course, it's not so bad for me sitting in the front seat here, but poor cam ops, they get thrown around a bit. <laughs> Jandre says it's like a massage. Uh, Jandre, I think the massages you've had in your life are slightly different to the ones I've had. I'd say that's more like someone punching you in the kidneys. So this is the spot where we heard that leopard. That we heard those leopards from. So if they're not over there, maybe they went that way. Now the positive thing about mating leopards is that even if we don't find them this evening, there's a really good chance they're gonna be around tomorrow. And so guys, please, even if you don't see them on the Juma cam, those of you who watch and listen to the Juma cam, listen out for that sound of mating leopards. And remember to let us know before the sunrise safari starts, give us a good idea where to go start looking. Now, I know a few of you were after a beautiful sunset. Unfortunately, the sun has set. It has dipped below the western horizon. Hence the chilliness that is set in. Shamsan. Shamsan is asking whether I've checked my camera trap. I did. Unfortunately, all that was on it is in Nyala, but I have it with me again, and we will look for a spot to put it out tonight. Do you see a hyena? Oh, that's on the other camera trap, so I've got two. Uh, it's not the best video, so we're actually not going to share it just yet, but we're planning uh, to reposition it slightly, and uh, occasionally, if uh, people like Chandre forget to put the dustbins away in the kitchen uh, and they leave the dustbins out. Uh, Howard, now Howard is a generic name for all hyena, all hyenas are Howard. Howard the hyena comes in the dark of night and it was actually incredible. You could see how strong a hyena was. Those big black dustbins, she had it by the bottom lip. So she had it like that and had it clear off the ground and was running out of camp with the dustbin in her mouth. So we're hoping to get some good footage of that. Or even just the hyenas are wandering around camp at night. Once everyone goes to bed, they come to see if we've left a mess for them to scavenge off. See, I think those leopards might have gone into this ravine system to the west of us. 
is one of the few areas that is near impossible to get a vehicle into. I'm worth maybe just listening for a few seconds here. Continue to search. <laughs> uh, cat in Tampa says, What is a dustbin? Well, cat, uh, what would you call it in America? Trash can. <laughs> A garbage can, a trash can, uh, uh, yeah, so uh, that is what we call a dirt bin. Oh no, that's probably also a dustbin or dirt bin, a very English ways um, of uh, talking about a trash can. Keep on the fire break now. So hold on. Not used too often, although I see Jamie's tracks here from this morning. Continue our search for the mystery mating leopards. I wonder what Jamie's up to. I am racing off in the direction of where Brent is checking. Well, no, we're we planning a search together in order to help him out in the search for this mating leopard pair that's been avoiding us since this morning. This morning I was sitting with Dave at Sydney's Dam. And I just turned my engine on and I heard, you know, those funny mating, Dave's laughing at me, um, <laughs> those funny mating leopard sounds that they make. But I wasn't sure if it was lions or leopards. And I sat for a while and I thought, okay, because it's taking them so long, it's probably lions. Because leopards, especially first thing in the morning, tend to mate with a greater frequency. Now we know, they've been wondering about, they came through from Buffles Hook onto Juma. And I think, oh, hold on. Oh, uh, it sounds as though they have crossed everybody, unfortunately. Just got that update from Brent, he's heard them. And it sounds as though they've gone wandering onto Buffles Hook. Oh, so what a pity. Never, never mind. There's still some lions hiding somewhere in here. We'll go and search for them instead. Now, just to go back to our World Tiger Day and the celebration of all animals, great and small, I just wanted to use this as an opportunity to say that I think that Safari Live as an experience is an incredibly valuable tool in conservation. And that I mean by that is by bringing real life stories to people across the globe so that they can watch the animals, become attached to them and actually become invested in saving them and providing for their future is a really truly wonderful tool of conservation. So for all of you out there, particularly our new viewers, because I know our regular viewers are so, so good at doing this already and they definitely don't need me to tell them this. But for our new viewers, if you are enjoying the live safari experience, please, please tell all your friends, let them know so that we can spread the amazing word of the incredible creatures out here as far and as wide as possible. Because the more people watch, the more they get a true concept of the way in which the animals of Africa truly work and function, and just how important it is that we invest our energy in protecting them. And that, I think, is where, as wonderful as Safari Live is in terms of bringing stories and characters, that is where its true magic actually lies. And, of course, bringing joy to people across the world. To be able to sit for two hours and watch leopard cubs, how spoiled are we? And I would hope that one day the next generation and the generation after that will be able to grow up with the same privileges that we've had. 
Not something that we would ever want them to lose the opportunity of enjoying. And we're very fortunate to be in an area as protected as this one is. What I also think that it does is it raises awareness as to what is, what is right and what is wrong in terms of filming animals and the amount of respect that one should have for them. Now, on the World Tiger Day, we might not have any tigers, although I do think we get new viewers every now and again that are a little bit disappointed at the lack of striped cats and somewhat surprised since they aren't truly aware of exactly where we are. Um, we're sorry to disappoint you for those of you who want to see tigers on World Tiger Day, but we do have some amazing animals of our own. And World Tiger Day is just an opportunity for us to think about the bigger picture. Not that most of you don't. I know that our viewers are all like-minded in that respect, like-minded in their love and their desire to protect and to help the animals of Africa and around the world. Big tiger safaris, live tiger safaris. Oh, the dream, the dream one day. There's so many amazing animals to see. Right, so where are these lions? Speaking of amazing animals, amazing animals that have spent two days dodging me. And that's a wonderful message coming through from Vic. I'm glad, so, I'm so, so glad that you agree with me in terms of the power that these live drives really have in terms of opening up people's eyes and investing them in these animals' future. I'm glad Vic is a new viewer and he agrees with my idea of what Safari Live is all about. And it's why I will remain committed to the Wild Earth team, because I think that we have, what we have at the moment, is pure magic. And I still remain convinced it's also the best technology use of that has ever been. Okay, maybe that's a slight exaggeration, because there's lots of amazing technology things out there. But this is definitely one of the best uses I can think of putting all kinds of incredible minds together to bring a live safari from the middle of the African bush. And sometimes the days are frustrating and sometimes they're wonderful and sometimes things go our way and sometimes it doesn't. It's the joy of live wildlife filming when we say, Dave, there's a bird, and Dave goes, where? There, where? Oh, it's flown away. Never mind. <laughs> Which is entirely our fault. I'm not in any way criticizing Dave. Or the animals evade us, as the lions have done with me for the last two days. Nice surprise with our elephant sighting this morning. But you never know what's around the next corner. To coin a phrase that was, I think, originally coined by the wonderful Hayden Turner. Right, well, no more waxing lyrical from me. I'm going to continue on. And Brent can continue the profound statements of the beauty out here with his lovely view. See, I, I'm not sure I'm quite good at waxing lyricals. So I'll just let the, the scene and do the talking for me. So Haley was asking for a, a sunset, so we couldn't give you the sun setting, it had already disappeared. But I'll give you a wonderful silhouette of the Drakensberg Mountains. And as you can see in front of the mountains, how undulating the country is around here. Not massive hills, but you can see the little river valleys, and you can just see that slight sort of dust in, in them at the moment. And that is absolutely stunning. And there we go, there's the, the Great Road West the northern boundary of Juma. But we're going to go have a look down towards Sydney's waterfall. Something just crossed the road. What is that? It could, I don't know. I just saw some a bit of movement. No, no, sorry. It was a bit closer than that. Sorry, Jean -Dre. Um, I had my eyes and my binoculars. Jean -Dre was being your binoculars. But whatever it is, it's just off to the left. It was quite small, I think maybe a, 
Impala or a Dyker, but I don't know, there was something there that made me want to have a quick look. Oh, I, as I was saying, but I absolutely love this time of the year. Tracking is wonderful because, it, well, not after a little bit of rain we had, but tracking is nice and easy. And, well, it's never easy per se, but it's easier uh, than in the summer months. Okay, so it crossed, I'd say, around where these trees were. Could have been a Steenbock, could have been a Diker. Could have been something far more interesting. It's definitely enough to sort of perk my interest. You got something? It's a diker. Oh dear, there it goes. Oh dear, they do, they often are the ones that get us. And especially in low light and night, because their movements for an antelope are quite cat like. Sneaky little diker. But maybe something is enjoying the open area. Oh, we're going to try, Jandre, before it runs. There we go. There's the sneaky little diker. Oh, it suddenly realized it's been spotted. Boom. It's another little female. That little tuft of hair between her ears. But can they see me? Can't they see me? Should I keep still? Should I run? Oh, decisions, decisions. No, they can't see me. I'm just going to keep foraging. Now, quite interestingly, what that dike is specifically foraging off underneath that guari tree is probably uh, dried guari berries. There's still quite a lot of sugar in them. And lots of animals, especially in this drought, will take advantage. Like, oh, maybe they can see me. Oh, no, that's okay. I'm safe. Very graceful little antelope. This is that incredible time of the day. It's sort of the changing of the guards, where your diurnal creatures go completely quiet and your nocturnal creatures wake up. I mean, listen, there's almost not a sound. If we keep quiet, there's literally not a sound. In the distance, there's the one creature who likes to call, or maybe trumpet the changing of the guards, and that's the white browed scrub room, but it's quite far away. I can just make it out in the distance. Uh, and of course, a forktail jungle making noise. Jandre has spotted a buffalo weaver nest in that knob thorn tree. Not being used actively at the moment, of course, but summer is around the corner. So what I'm going to do is, once it's dark, a little later, I'm going to listen again and, and see if we can find, if we, we make it through the changing of the guards to hear the nocturnal creatures. I really just don't want to turn on my lights yet and just spoil this awesome atmospheric light we've got at the moment. Just having a quick look at Sydney's waterhole. And the only thing I can see is catfish breaking the surface of the the water, there we go, you can see those ripples there. And to the northwest, the Manuletti Game Reserve. What have you look seen, John there? The Manuletti. The Manuletti. John is zooming on the Manuletti. Let's just come back to the water there. Zoom in on the water. Now, as a fisherman, to the right slightly, as a fisherman, uh, it's always something I love to see, the evening rise. almost feel like I should be popping a dry fly out there. Uh, 
Oh, okay. Well, nothing happening yet. So let's head towards Impala Plains. So while we keep moving through the western sectors of Gemma, let's find out how Jamie's trip. Oh, she's also. I suppose she's in the north, northern central area of Juma. I am exactly in the northern central, pretty much smack bang in the middle on our northern boundary, searching once again in the last few moments of our sunset safari for those lions. And what an absolutely stunning evening. And I love the way that Brent described it as a changing of the guard from the daytime animals to the nighttime animals. There's this sense of expectation in the air and an excitement. And I don't think it's just, well, perhaps it's a very human thing because there's all kinds of exciting prospects. But I think for the animals as well, they get, they get that sort of tense feeling of expectation. For the prey species, it's another night that they have to try and get through and survive, but it's such a beautiful night. It's nice and still. It's a night for the prey species rather than for the predators. And then, of course, the predators are coming out, starting to stretch their limbs, give a couple of big yawns and a couple of licks of the paw, and then moving off into the night. Ah, oh, it's so exciting. It's one of my favorites. I've got these early childhood memories of going out with my parents on night drives. Whenever we'd go and visit a reserve, it was a special treat that I got to go on a night drive. And I remember being freezing all the time somehow. And yet at the same time, it's just magic. Andrew from the Ukraine, it's lovely to hear from you once again. Andrew would like to know if I've ever heard of tiger canyons in South Africa. I think I know which, which particular tiger, that's a sanctuary, right? Or a sanctuary in, in South Africa. I use that term loosely because I don't know much about it. Um, Andrew, I honestly don't know all that much about tiger canyon. I still, I struggle with the idea of I kind of understand it in terms of bringing a big cat into a place where there are big cats and they survive here, but it's not really where they belong. But if we can keep them safe here, I suppose it is a different story. It's a grey area for me. I struggle with the idea of animals being outside of their natural habitat, their natural environment, because I wonder what havoc it plays with their senses and with their psychology. But I don't know. I don't know enough about it. I don't understand enough about it. Graham put up this amazing article that I read recently, which basically was a, a scathing report on scientists and how far back this approach has put us in terms of understanding animal behavior. But basically the idea that by making this idea that anthropomorphizing an animal is, is not a good thing, you can't, you can't put human emotions to them, it would be ridiculous to suggest that, I think the quote was, people are people and animals are animals, and that was the idea, that animals don't have these feelings. Uh, I struggle with that, I've always struggled with that, and it was nice to see somebody else sharing the same opinion. I've seen something here. Eeyo. I don't know where it was. It's a set of eyes that I'm relatively certain was a Dacre. I say that now every time because I don't want to make that mistake again. It's gone. I think it was that Dacre that ran past me earlier. The Dacres are the tricksters of the bush. I think it must have been. If it were a little mystery cat, it was something low to the ground. If it were a little mystery cat, we would have, see, it would have stuck around. They don't tend to run away when there's, at night when there's a spotlight. They tend to freeze and remain anonymous. I'm turning off all my lights, making sure all my lights are off. Hi, guys. Hello, hello. Bye. Aubrey and his guests, a very merry bunch from what we hear from our camp next door. 
So the, the lion den site is not far away from where I am at all. Obviously, I'm definitely not going to go in there now. They are very, very tiny cubs, so I'm not going to go in and spotlight them. I'm basically just hoping to catch a glimpse of mom as she returns to feed them. So Herbert found it just tucked away in this drainage line that runs parallel to a road called Gauri Cut Line. For those of you who are familiar with it, you'll know where I mean in terms of our proximity to the dam. So keep an eye on the Juma Dam camera tonight. There's a very good chance that the lionesses are going to come and drink from it. Even though there's lots of groundwater still around, it's starting to get muddy and a little bit brackish almost. And they might decide that the Juma Dam is a much better prospect to go and drink from. The den site, from what Herbert described, is right in here. But as I said, <clears throat> we're not going to go barreling in to try and see the cubs. We'll wait for our opportunity tomorrow morning. We'll check up on them tomorrow morning, although Herbert says it's very difficult to get a vehicle in there. And if we can't, then we'll just wait for the next kill when the lionesses bring their cubs out. Because those cubs are going to start getting to the age where they will be able to come out and join the rest of the pride. Eight little lion cubs. Ah, oh, what a joy. And as we enjoy the beauty and the stillness of the evening air and the smells of the African bush in the winter, it comes time for us to say goodbye to you all and to do our thank yous. A big thank you to Dave, as always, for his fantastic camera work. It is always, we're very, very fortunate to have the skilled cameraman that we have. And a very big thank you to Rebecca and to Jerry in Vinyl Control as always doing a fantastic job and then most importantly a big thank you to all of you watching across the globe and don't forget to celebrate world tiger day in whatever way you can just appreciating the magnificence of the creatures around us i will catch up with you tomorrow morning on the sunrise safari but for now i will say goodbye and thank you once again So we're just checking, I want to check one of my favorite bush baby spots. I'm also looking for a spot to pop up the camera trap, see if we can find any, oh no, no, wrong button, uh, nocturnal critters, and there's some nice paths around. <coughs> what do you think, Jean-Ray, should we put it up on one of these elephant paths coming up? There's civet, white-tailed mongoose in this area, possibly serval. And there we go. So remember, today is International Tiger Day. We only have one, or actually two creatures out here in Southern Africa uh, that share a name with the tiger. That is, of course, the tiger fish, one of my favorite critters to catch on my fly rods. And uh, then in Afrikaans, there is another creature called the Tierboskat. So translated, it means the tiger bush cat. And that is, of course, a serval. Uh, we're hoping to catch a tear boss cut on the camera trap. I think, where do you think? Down. Should we put it on the edge of quarantine somewhere? On a game path. John o reckons game path. Yes, that's, that's no way. There's a nice path around here somewhere. But as we're saying, we're going to be looking for the tear boss cut on the camera trap. I think there's a good game path. So there we go. There's a really nice game path going off there. So I'm going to pop it on that tree there. So jean Ray, may I have a cable tie, please? Um, yeah. I will. So I might, keep, I might be off the vehicle. So jean Ray might have to tell me um, when... Oh, dear. Okay, let's get that right. Thank you.
<laughs> Hi, Jeffrey from Texas. Jeffrey, we appreciate that comment very much. Jeffrey says, while the safaris are the totes, my goats, or whatever these kids say these days, I wouldn't know either, Jeffrey. So, Jean Ray, if we, we start running out of time, you're going to have to let me know. Oh, I can't see, I'm blind. If I was a lion, now would be the time to take advantage of me. If you were a lion out there. And Jean Ray will pretend to warn me. So, we're just going to pop this up quickly. Uh, as I say, it's been magnificent, and I'm sure you guys had a wonderful time with Jamie and uh, Karula's wonderful little creatures. So I'm just going to get this all set. And I'm hoping that they'll still be there in the morning. There's not much of that kill going to be left, but they could still be enjoying. I'd also keep an eye on the Juma Dam Cam for Karula and those mating leopards, because they either of them could make an appearance. Also, in Kahuma lines are somewhere around this area, so they could also make an appearance. So keep watching and remember, send us through all those updates in the morning. And you can do that by using Twitter and the hashtag Safari Live. Or you can, oh dear, it's too short, my chain. Hang on a second, sorry about that. Um, or you can pop an email to questions at wildearth.tv. So we will be out and at it again on the Sunrise Safari in a few short hours. And I know a lot of you will be ecstatic to hear that Commander Bond and shall be returning shortly, uh, I think on Sunday. Uh, so James will be back, and it'll be great to have him back in camp uh, as his great entertainment as always. Jean how are we doing for time? About a minute. Oh, about a minute. I, th I thought I was yakking uh, too long. And oh, there we go, camera trap up. I don't know if you can see me hiding between the tree here. And it's cable tie it on. One should suffice. But I'm hoping we have a little bit more luck hunting for those mating leopards tomorrow morning. As I said, there's a good chance they're still going to be around. Now, this is a presenting and putting up a camera trap and doing a closing is a little bit more difficult than I thought it was going to be. Uh, hopefully, I will manage. 30. 30 seconds. Okay, there we go. Am I going to manage? Oh dear, I think, no, yes, I didn't put the cable tie the wrong way around. But as I said, uh, thank you for joining us on Safari Live. And we can't wait to do it all again bright and early tomorrow morning on the, the Sunrise Safari. So from Jandre, the Oompa Loompa, myself and the rest of the Safari Live team, we'll see you very soon.